Yes. Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events. Tonight, in celebration of the sesquicentennial of the birth of one of this country's most important writers, Professor Jean Andrew Jarrett joins us to discuss his latest book, A 12-Year Labor of Love, entitled Paul Lawrence Dunbar, The Life and Times of a Caged Bird. His biography has been called both magisterial and elegant. Henry Louis Gates Jr. writes, Jean Jarrett has done far more than write a fascinating book for our times. By providing the definitive rendering of Dunbar's flight, Jarrett has set free the artist who first heard the caged bird sing. Jean Andrew Jarrett is the Dean of the Faculty and William S. Todd Professor of English at Princeton University. He is the author of Representing the Race, A New Political History of African American Literature, and Deans and Truants, Race and Realism in African American Literature. He is the editor of an additional eight books of African American Literary Studies, including the collected novels and the complete stories of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Tonight, Professor Jarrett will be in conversation with Herman Beavers, Professor of English and Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, Beavers is the author of the scholarly monograph, Geography and the Political Imaginary in the Novels of Toni Morrison, the poetry chapbook, Obsidian Blues, and his poems have appeared in Cleaver Magazine, Versadelphia, and the American Arts Quarterly, among other publications. It's a pleasure to have them both with us this evening. Please welcome Jean Andrew Jarrett and Herman Beavers. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, it was rainy all day, so uh, we're particularly happy to see you. Um, I am delighted to be with my friend and colleague, Jean Jarrett. Um, we're going to talk about this fantastic book. So why don't we get right to it? Um, so Jean, I wanted to ask you um, about your first book, Deans and Truants. Mm -hmm. Um, and I and I I'm, I, I want to sort of start there because you portray Dunbar as a writer whose career represents a clear case of resistance against what we might call the racial orthodoxy of the moment. You know, the racial orthodoxy governing the literary literary representation of black life. And so, what role did that first project play in your decision to undertake a biography on Dunbar? That's a great question, and thanks uh, for spending time with me, Herman. Uh, so uh, Deans and Truants was my very first uh, book that I published. Uh, as I was coming out of uh, graduate school, I examined a genre of African American literature where either there was depictions of whiteness or there was some aspirations by African American authors to portray what they could perceive to be a universal experience. And Paul Lawrence Dunbar was one of the authors who was grappling with that kind of um, uh, genre. Uh, he uh, produced poetry on the one hand that uh, expressed African American experiences, and he also on the other hand produced uh, uh, poems in formal English, as it was called at that time, that uh, tried to aspire to these kinds of universal meanings. He also was someone who uh, produced fiction, particularly his first novel, The Uncalled, that uh, in a sense uh, kind of uh, veered or diverged from let's say his last novel, The Sport of the Gods, in a sense of, uh, it was a kind of a spiritual autobiography in the, in the guise of uh, fiction. So Deans and Truants enabled me to uh, embark on a serious study of Paul Lawrence Dunbar in the first couple of chapters uh, of that work. And it and that allowed me to understand, first of all, what were the debates among scholars about Dunbar, uh, you know, the ways in which he was someone who was called the poet laureate of his race on, on the one hand. He enjoyed the commercial success that came with that title, but on the other hand, he was haunted by the ways in which it embedded certain kinds of racial preconceptions uh, about him. And so it, it, it gave me the sense that there was a lot to talk about. Uh, I enjoyed reading his work. Uh, I enjoyed uh, gathering uh, letters of correspondence that he had written. Uh, to others, but also letters that others had written to him to flesh out the full dimensions of his life. And so I would like to say that that book gave me confidence that I could 
uh, delve into uh, Dunbar's life, literature, and times in a significant way. And by the time I was working on my third book, um, when I think I was more mature as a thinker and as a writer, I decided to make that commitment. Uh, and I did that uh, about 10 to 12 years ago. So, um, you know, there's so many directions to go, but, um, you know, one thing I was thinking about as I was, um, you know, delving into the book this morning, um, you do a really great job of explicating the lives of Dunbar's parents, and particularly his mother, um, and, you know, what it would have meant to live in the 19th century in a city like Dayton, in a state like Ohio, um, at a, at more or less the sort of burging of Reconstruction. Um, what do you think, um, when we look at particularly Dun Dunbar's father and, and his struggles with alcohol and trauma, do you think, I mean, we can do a kind of eatable thing here, but I, 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 want, I don't want to necessarily get us caught up in that. But I did want to ask you about, um, you know, it seems such a tragedy that this monumental talent lives such a short and troubled life. And so um, do you, what correlations do you see between Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the poet, and his father, Joshua, the very highly literate, you know, very articulate uh, Civil War veteran who had serious problems in his life with, with substance abuse? Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Uh, the first couple of chapters of this biography were really tough to write uh, because uh, they focus on Dunbar's parents, Joshua and Latilda. And uh, Joshua was to a degree literate, uh, so was his mother, but they weren't as advanced as someone like Frederick Douglass, who was an author of you know, multiple autobiographies, or Harriet Jacobs, who was an author of um, a, a what was called the you know slave narrative, or the number of African American writers of that time whose literature we read and celebrate today, and so the difficulty existed in how do you reconstruct the lives of people who did not produce diaries, did not produce literature, did not write uh, autobiographies in the conventional sense, and so the first few years of working on this book entailed that I do a lot of research on what did it mean to be a slave in Kentucky? What did it mean to uh, aspire uh, for freedom uh, in the wake of emancipation? What did it mean to settle in a town such as Dayton where his parents had met? And so in that respect, uh, I think by laying out the full historical and uh, cultural context of his parents, I was able to get uh, some degree of insight into how they were living and the kind of challenges that they faced. Paul Lawrence Dunbar lived in the household where his parents, who were rather temperamental, uh, they had you know different. They had visions of the future. The father was someone who had just served uh, in the Civil War, and he was dealing with the psychological repercussions of that experience. Um, his mother had two children from a previous relationship, and this was a full household of people that she was trying to uh, superintend, if you will. Uh, this was an environment where Dunbar saw the best side of his parents, but also the challenging sides. Eventually, they had parted ways, his parents. And to some degree, uh, Dunbar was as temperamental as his parents were individually. Some of the strife that he witnessed in his household uh, as a child, he also had uh, demonstrated in his own experiences with uh, Alice Ruth Moore, who he came to to marry. And so there are some connections that you can make. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be careful, as you say, not to go too deeply in a psychoanalytical s sense. But I do think that there are certain trends that you see. And, and what I do try to suggest in certain areas was how did the child repl replicate some of the behaviors, some of the thoughts of his parents um, as he was trying to aspire to be a writer. Well, there's a particularly poignant moment early in the book when um, a young Paul uh, Lawrence Dunbar and his mother are in the cemetery and he locates his father's um, grave. Um, 
And you talk about the fact that, that he had this real attachment to his father, even though you make pretty clear that they did not spend a lot of time together. Right. Um, so I w was wondering if you could talk about that. And then um, I want to sort of segue to um, a question about right, African-American writers and injustice. Sure. Um, so that is a scene where his father um, was at a veteran's home and he had passed away and there was a ceremony where he was buried and, and Paul Lawrence Dunbar as a child uh, with his mother at times would go to uh, that burial site and uh, it was rather emotional for him. The thing I would say is on the one hand you could be rather conscious of the ways in which you embody the traits of your parents or of those who take care of you. And there are other ways in which unwittingly you are, are, are kind of imbibing or absorbing uh, some of their personality. I think Paul Lawrence Dunbar was someone who was remarkably attached to um, his parents in different ways. And you have to remember when you're at a time in the late 19th century, uh, you know, slavery was so disruptive in tearing apart families. You know, families are rather fragile uh, at that moment in time. And there are ways in which if you're not within slavery per se, where you know, you, a relative might be sold away, or you might be sold away, or your parents would be sold away, you're dealing with the aftermath of slavery, the repercussions, the trauma of slaves who had, of former slaves who had undergone that experience of bondage. And so Paul Ernst Dunbar was in a family that was uh, rather unstable and to the extent that he was able to build uh, relationships with his parents, uh, he tried and they tried to um, uh, take care of him and raise him, but obviously there are a whole range of circumstances that I talk about in the book that uh, pull them apart. Thank you for that. Um, you know, there's, there's Hemingway's old uh, chestnut uh, where he says writers are forged in injustice as a sword is forged. Um, so two parts of the question. First, do you think that's especially true for African-American writers? And, and more sort of pointedly, how does injustice figure into Dunbar's career? Because you know, my understanding of him is that he was not understood in the way that he understood himself, uh, particularly as a poet. Yeah, um, you know, certainly as you're an African American writer, you're trying to find your 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 vision, your voice, in order to uh, express yourself, and you're doing so negotiating between the perception you have of yourself, the extent to which you have that courage, that self confidence, to um, demonstrate a literary experience that people would understand, but you also have uh, the certain preconceptions, the pre prejudices of the world and the ways in which various stereotypes to a degree can be imposed on you. And so Paul Lawrence Dunbar, as I you know, allude to in the subtitle of the book, um, he thought of himself or he crafted the idea of a caged bird. Uh, so in the poem uh, Sympathy, there's a notion of the speaker says, I, I know why the cage bird sings. And that is a, a phrase that speaks to, in my view, the individual str struggle against societal perceptions and the ways in which these perceptions of you can inhibit the full kind of expanse of your opportunities. And so as an African American like Paul Lawrence Dunbar in the late 19th century, in the where you have the backdrop of racial segregation or intense discrimination where slavery just ended only three decades earlier, he's trying to find his way as a writer. So I do think that Paul Lawrence Dunbar himself is emblematic of that kind of experience. And I try to coordinate references to his literature where he talks about that, but also certain ev evidence in his life. So I, I wondered if we could talk a little bit about Dunbar's relationship to the literary marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, because um, on the one hand, um, he's a frustrated romantic poet. But on the other hand, he's probably along with Charles Chestnut, one of the most successful African-American writers of his moment. So, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how Dunbar went about negotiating the literary marketplace, particularly after William Dean Howell's uh, review of his work. 
Thanks, Herman. And, and by the way, these are tough questions. I mean, these, you know, Professor Beavers is, is not messing around here. So, uh, so I, I, this, was a, this is an, an excellent uh, question. And I think when we look at Paul Lawrence Dunbar, particularly his publication of the book Majors and Minors in 1895, you know, that is a work where he was trying to demonstrate some degree of versatility as a poet. So he was leaning on some of the writers of his time, like Whittier, and I call them the schoolroom poetry of American authors on the one hand. Um, but he also uh, was producing literature, uh, poems that had expressions of what was called a black dialect. And the marketplace, as it were, at that time, truly appreciated that kind of language, either in literature or in performance. And so you have someone like uh, James Whitcomb Riley, he was a Midwestern writer who performed dialect poetry and he, it, to rave reviews. And Paul Lawrence Dunbar himself performed that kind of poetry to rave reviews. I'd like to say that uh, when uh, William Howells praised this work in Harper's Weekly in, um, in uh, 1896, um, that was obviously a, an issue of Harper's Weekly that was widely read because it included references to the Republican nomination for the presidency at that time. Um, and so people were reading Howells's column called Life and Letters. And in there, uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar was anointed, in a sense, the, Paul Law, the, the poet laureate of his race. Paul Lawrence Dunbar enjoyed that praise and also the ways in which that praise billowed out to different newspapers, to all parts of the country and also parts of Europe at that time. And so he achieved great international fame. And so in a way, he was entering his literary prime and the marketplace uh, of American literature truly embraced him as the poet laureate of his race, if you will. But that title as well kind of boxed him in and that alludes again to the idea of the caged bird. Uh, he was someone who's trying to express himself as a poet to demonstrate that he had uh, great uh, expertise in this genre in a variety of ways, but he was being celebrated especially for one kind of poetry, for one kind of expression, and that was in uh, the dialect that represented uh, either presumably illiterate slaves or those who uh, didn't master the refinements of the language that you would find in what was called then formal English. And so he wrestled with that, and I point to evidence in letters where you would find that he would send uh, William Dean Howells, who was then the Dean of American Letters, great uh, uh, recognition and praise, thanking him for uh, what he had bestowed on him. But on the other hand, he would also correspond to family and friends saying that he's haunted by this praise because as much as he's earning money, it actually has confined him to this particular genre of literary art. So I want to take a sort of different tact, and, and, and um, I'm doing that because in our present moment, we are in, I mean, I, I don't even think it's accurate to call it a renaissance. There's been this explosion of African-American poetry, with African-American yes. poets winning the Pulitzer Prize, and the National Book Award, and having really high visibility. And we're still having that conversation about the vernacular. Yes. There's, there's, still, there's still this pull back and forth between um, writing elegant um, verse and writing verse in the voice of the communities that some poets come from where it really is sort of deeply grounded in the vernacular. So I was wondering if you could talk about how Dunbar figures into that because what happens by the time we get to James Weldon Johnson's anthology of, of, of Negro poetry is that he says, look, you know, the problem with, with dialect poetry is that it sort of gives you two stops, pathos and humor. And there, now I, I think he's wrong about that, and I have an example of why I think he's wrong. But um, just how, you know, Dunbar continues to be a lightning rod for discussions about um, A, racial allegiance, and B, how language figures into our notions of racial allegiance. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great question. 
Uh, and so you think of uh, James Weldon Johnson, who's closer to the time period of the Harlem Renaissance. You also think about writers such as Zora Neale Hurston, mm -hmm. right? Or even writers such as uh, Claude McKay. Uh, you know, the, the various writers of the Harlem Renaissance who uh, embarked on a truly sophisticated approach to the vernacular, a vernacular that is a centerpiece for understanding African American experiences or the relationship of African Americans to language. And so there is a rather intrinsic beauty to the vernacular that comes to be appreciated in a way beyond the kind of caricatures that were mm -hmm. existing during the time of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And so I guess Paul Lawrence Dunbar is that lightning rod because there's a way that his understanding of black dialect or the ways in which he's framed as a black dialect poet are ensconced within this kind of caricature of his times, right? How he is, you know, the black version of James Whitcomb Riley, or he's the black version of the Midwestern white poet who understands regional dialect. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, if you were to take a closer look at his work, was a rather sophisticated literary stylist in the realm of dialect. And mm -hmm. scholars today are revisiting some of these works to peel away some of the layers of how he was a master of form, but also some of the various themes inside of this writing. So I think that if through the kinds of developments in writings of the vernacular and studies of the vernacular in the 20th century, you can have a more sophisticated reading of Dunbar himself. So I'm inclined to say that the biography enables, it provides a foundation on which you can do that new kind of close reading. But I'll also say that nowadays, and, and you're right, uh, we have um, great interest in uh, poetry by African Americans and winning prizes. You have uh, you know, delivering an address at, at uh, Biden's inauguration mm -hmm. you know, before the world. Mm -hmm. And there's a way in which these poets have mastered the genre of poetry in general, but also they are celebrating the essential beauty of African American experiences through language, and they're not imprisoned in some of the kinds of either, as he, uh, James Walden Johnson said, the humor and pathos, or some of the caricatures that had been prevalent in the late 19th century. So I do think that this dawning of great interest in African American poetry can be telescoped through uh, a, a, an understanding and appreciation of Dunbar. So I want, uh, there's a poem by Dunbar that I teach all the time. It's not a very well-known poem, mm -hmm. but, um, and it's in dialect, but, but I think it's one of the most um, complex representations of what it means to be a slave. So the poem is called A Warmed In Winter. So if you, with all, <laughs> I hope Paul Lawrence Dunbar will forgive me, it's called A Warmed In Winter. Sunshine on the meadows, greenness on the way, that's the blessed reason I sing all the day. Look here, what you axin? What makes me so merry? Spect to see me sighing when it's warm in February? Long mistaken writer, seen a robin set. Why hit monster thaw thawing? Ground is monsters wet. Then you, look, then you stand there wondering, looking scared and starey. Eyes are right to caper when it's warm in February. Missus gone a driving, master gone to shoot, Every docky lazing, in the sun to boot. Quarters mighty pleasant, hanging round my Mary. Court and bound to prosper when it's warm in February. Cider looks so putty, pouring in from the jug. Don't you see us happy? Hear it laughing, glug? Now's the time for people for to try and bury all day grief and sorrow when it's warm in February. Um, with all, I hope Paul Dorn's Lawrence oh, number will forgive me. But here's why I think this is such a complicated poem. Um, it's in dialect. So on the one hand, he's satisfying uh, his reading public. But this poem, yes. I, I teach this poem all the time because this poem says the only way that slaves can, can reach the full zenith of their humanity is when there's an aberration in the winter weather. It's such a nuanced, it's such a nuanced point. But but this is, you know, previous to discovering this poem, I was down on Dunbar pretty hard. And then I read this poem and I'm like, well, wait a minute. Um, yeah, he's pretty good. Because when I think of this poem, when I think of Annie Bellum's sermon, mm -hmm. 
um, and I think of a couple other poems, Dunbar is clearly, clearly uh, invested in the idea of signifying on the one hand, signifying on his audience. And in this instance, um, I have a feeling this flew so far under the radar, white readers reading this did not pick up on the, on, because, you know, when he uses the word docky, and so thereby suggesting the happy docky, what he's actually saying is, black joy and black happiness and black humanity is contingent yes. on aberration. Yes. And, and uh, just to build on that, I think the key word uh, that I hear in your reading of it is humanity. Uh, you know, Dunbar, when he was writing his work, even when, it, when it's in uh, black dialect, he presumed the humanity of African Americans. And that's a fundamental distinction that you find between his writing, Charles Chestnut's writing, and for example, uh, Thomas Nelson Page or George Washington Cable. Mm -hmm. Those were white writers of the post uh, bellum 19th century who also wrote in black dialect. But in those works, if you look at them closely, the African American characters or their, the speakers there are rather flat, right? There's no three dimensionality in how they are represented in the literature. What Dunbar and Charles Chestnut had done as you approach the turn of the 20th century is to imbue African Americans, even through the expression of dialect, with a certain kind of humanity that shows that, number one, that they are complex individuals, right? That they have a a kind of a multidimensional personality. Uh, but I would also add that they have a certain kind of agency in the extent to which they are trying to dictate their life fortune. That they're not just beholden to a world that discriminates against them, but they are ambitious. They have feelings of great strength, but there's also moments of misery. And the ways in which, if you document the complexity of African American life, that uh, does underwrite your sense of their being human beings. And so Dunbar himself, through his writing, was exceptional at that. And if you take a close look at his dialect poems, you'll see that reaffirmed. Thank you for that. Um, so I want to turn briefly to uh, Terry T. Green's book, uh, her biography of uh, Dunbar's uh, former wife, Alice Dunbar Nelson. And one of the things that's clear as the sort of biographical um, mm. narrative emerges about Dunbar Nelson is that it's easy to make Paul Lawrence Dunbar the foil in her narrative. And I'm wondering if there's a, um, a more complicated, slippery even, space that we can navigate such that um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, because uh, it's clear that you know, it's clear from the, the, the sort of early chapters where you talk about their courtship. It's clear that um, she helped him immensely. And I, I want to say that he helped her, but what, what it's it really easy to fall into is to say that Alice Dunbar Nelson, because we find out um, from the, the letters and the diaries, um, which I think Gloria Hull did in probably mm -hmm. the 1980s, um, you know, we find out that she is, her sexuality is not, um, does not square with heterosexual, you know, uh, black women, politics, respectability type of subjectivity. It's, it's different, but what I, what I fear is that Dunbar will get short shrift in this. And so the reason why I was happy to see your biography is because it's going to balance the scales a little bit. Yeah, um, I, I appreciate that. And, um, and I will say that uh, it was important to write this biography being as careful as possible about representing the ambitions of Alice Ruth Moore when he first met her, and also to uh, appreciate that she had her own complexity, she had her own right. wishes, her own aspirations. Uh, she outlived Paul Lawrence Dunbar well into uh, the Harlem Renaissance, and with the recent work, with the work done by Gloria Hull, as you as you said, she had a, a more complex sexuality than has been hitherto uh, portrayed in scholarship on on Dunbar. And so, one thing I wanted to do was to contribute to a more complete understanding of her 
in relation to Dunbar, and mm -hmm. also Dunbar's own relationship uh, to Alice. I should also say that I spend time talking about his relationship to someone named Rebecca Baldwin. Not many people know of her. It's someone that he had met when he was um, at the uh, World Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. And through their letters, you see that Dunbar was rather um, anxious. He was bipolar in certain instances. He was uh, truly concerned about whether he would be uh, an excellent writer. All of the various kinds of aspects of his personality that played them, themselves out in his relationship to Alice, we actually see a telegraphing of that in his early re relationship to Rebecca. So bringing her in the picture as well shows that uh, Dunbar uh, had certain tendencies of, in his behavior and we're able to draw some uh, conclusions there. Uh, I do acknowledge this uh, new work by Tara Green uh, in my uh, biography. It, it was published just at the time when I was uh, completing my work, but I do think that any opportunity we have to showcase Alice uh, Moore's life, Dunbar Nelson's uh, life as her name has evolved, um, I think that is important, and I'm glad to know that my biography can contribute to yeah, her there, appreciation. There's, there's wonderful synergy between them, I think, yeah. and, and I, I think that's, that's, that's great for African American literary and cultural studies just in, yeah. in general. So I want to, um, you know, mindful of the time, um, I want to sort of circle back to dialect literature for a second, but I want to look at it in a sort of wider perspective because um, at the time that Dunbar is writing, you have people like Bret Hart, um, you have Mark Twain, you have these writers who are writing, uh, when things are put in Head Wilson, for example, um, are writing these, these narratives that feature black characters who are, who are rendered in dialect. But here's, here's, here's where um, uh, I, I think that um, it's important to, one, talk about how, how highly contested dialect literature is in general, just when you think about the way that American English splinters off from British English, in part because we develop a vernacular that is completely foreign mm -hmm. to how British English is, is, is rendered. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, it's not just black dialects, it's Russian dialects, it's Midwest, Midwestern dialects, it's Appalachian dialects, it's New York um, dialects. So if you think of somebody like um, Hart Crane, for example, he's capturing that, that, that Brooklyn dialect in, in very effective ways. So on the one hand, there's a problem of elite readers reading this stuff and, and sort of concluding, you know, I understand black people because I've read Paul Lawrence Dunbar, which sets up something that I complain about all the time, <laughs> which is that people who read Toni Morrison's Beloved think that they, they really understand African-American literature. It just, it just drives me crazy. But, um, but the, the, here's, here's really where I want to go with this question. You know, we're in this moment where we've got all these debates about critical race theory. And um, in so many ways, the classes that you and I teach um, have the inherent purpose of refuting racial stereotypes filling in those historical silences created by neglect and disinterest, and all of a sudden, you've got this pushback against the idea of revising the mainstream narrative. And so the question that I think really emerges about Dunbar, and I think you do it really so ably in this book, is um, uh, the sort of intellectual and artistic dissonance around writing in dialect. Um, at a time when people want to go back to uh, the sort of unruffled, uncomplicated narrative f for, in which black people sort of disappear. Yes, I, I think that's well put. Uh, you know, the, uh, one of my colleagues, um, Gavin Jones, wrote a book called Strange Talk, where you know, he kind of likens it to a vogue for, for dialect in the late um, 19th century, particularly uh, the period after slavery where uh, a lot of Americans were reckoning with a new world of African Americans acquiring political franchise, right? And so they're 
emancipated. There's an accumulation of civil rights uh, through constitutional amendments. And so they are faced with this world of African Americans not only being human and, and complex uh, in contrast to their depictions and treatments during slavery, but they are people who are being increasingly empowered in economic and political spheres of the world. And so the thing that dialect did, it kind of encased a, a nostalgic view of African Americans, uh, the, the kind of nostalgia that embedded within it certain um, you know, racist notions of African Americans, certain sexist notions. It was a kind of a, these kind of classical, uh, it, at that time, white supremacist ideas of African American life. And what you have in these performances of dialect by performance either in person through recitation or in literature, you have an elite public that is seeing this performance, enjoying the performance, that kind of aesthetic engagement. And while they are enjoying this experience, they're also hearkening back to a time where uh, it, was, it was when African Americans, for example, were subordinate to whites, especially in all aspects uh, of, of the world. So what you have in someone like Paul Lawrence Dunbar is, you know, how is he able to evince this kind of vernacular in poetry and through recitation such that he's enjoyed by society, but at the same time, as we talked about the earlier poem, inside of these poems, he's depicting African Americans with agency, with complexity, with a multi-dimensional personality. This kind of double voice, if you will, is embedded in the notion of his poem, We Wear the Mask, this kind of mm -hmm. ways mm -hmm. in which do you have a mask, a veneer, that appeals to expectations of whites, if you will, that are rooted in certain racist notions at that time. And you have this kind of deeper sense of concern that belies that external representation. So that kind of double existence, if you will, uh, is encased in a lot of his poems. And it, it was a time when, that he was negotiating this when um, particularly there was a, a great interest in dialect work. Richard Cooper, faculty, Widener University, African American Studies and Social Work. Uh, I'll try to narrow it to one question versus 15. Number one, I'm gonna read the book and then I'm gonna come and see you talk again about it where I can ask better questions. But you framed it from within the context of resistance. Um, and so my sense is in your explanation that there's then an ability to kind of deconstruct and look at the layers and kind of look at uh, a, a black or African American perspective. Could you talk a little bit more about that? And do you find that it's difficult? For me, I would have to say colored Negro. When I say African Americans, he would have never called himself that. Mm -hmm. right. So I'm just wondering if you, if you thought about that as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so first of all, regarding resistance, the thing that I try to do is to develop as much evidence as I can about what were the thoughts that he had as he was uh, you know, imagining a poem and actually writing it. And so that's where there is great benefit in having, you know, in my case, over a thousand letters of correspondence where you could truly see uh, his creative process and how as he was crafting certain poems, he had particular personal feelings about what these poems were supposed to mean. And that is not to uh, delimit the full range of meaning in these poems, but it just it gives you a sense of uh, what was his inspiration. Uh, and there are instances in his letters where he does talk about how he was concerned about these broader cultural and social circumstances that um, in a way kind of uh, you know, contained uh, his full uh, array of expression. And through that concern, he was able to embed in his work a kind of critique of society. Uh, I should also say, and we've been talking a lot about his poems, but he was also uh, a writer, not only of fiction, but of nonfiction. He published essays, and so uh, he published a poem called The Raced Question Discussed, where he talks about the Wilmington, uh, North Carolina um, uh, mob violence by whites against African Americans. That was a, a city in Wilmington where you had African Americans who were embodied racial uplift, they were making economic and political progress, and he talks about that. So he was a rather prescient 
um, intellectual thinker. And if you pull all of that evidence together, then you have a sense of how he was remarkably concerned about these uh, prejudices and that therefore you could argue that there's some expression of resistance in his work. I will say one last thing regarding the second part of your question about African Americans. Certainly he would not say that. And in fact, I actually point to a, a letter where he explicitly says that he's resistant to African American. He feels as though it, uh, it is an ethnic fragmentation of identity. Um, but we do use it today, and I just tried to be uh, uh, consistent in my exposition. Lies, lies, bless the Lord. Don't you know the days are broad? If you don't get up, you tramp, there'll be trouble in this camp. My mother used to read Paul Arts Dunbar to me when I was a kid, and I loved when she would do it in the dialect. At the same time, we had to use proper English in the house all the time. I went on to have a very prolific career in broadcasting and in uh, media management because I could speak good English. <laughs> Today, in the 21st century, there's this big, big thing about Ebonics and the use of it, whereas Paul Lawrence Dunbar had no problem with the, the duality of our experience. Can you address that somewhat? Uh, that's, a, that's a great uh, question. You know, I, I think the thing uh, that's uh, remarkable about Dunbar is, and, and I remember um, there are other people who've told me that as a child they would recite Dunbar's poetry. Uh, even if you go to Ohio today and you go to certain um, museums, uh, you will find little children who recite his poems in order to receive uh, a certain gift from the museum. For example, at the, over, at the Wright Brothers um, Museum, I've seen that there. There is a kind of a deep acquaintance that people have with Dunbar because it enables you to have this immersion in language. And his language, particularly uh, in his, uh, his dialect poetry, is, is, a, is a kind of a, an intimate experience uh, with uh, African American life, if you will, in certain instances. And so it's not unusual to find people who have had such a deep uh, relationship with his work uh, historically. Uh, but obviously, uh, it was a flashpoint uh, at that moment in time because to what extent are you demonstrating intellectual refinement if you speak in that kind of language? I think what we're, what we're finding today, uh, and this goes back to an earlier point where we're talking about African American poetry, poetry today, is that there is such uh, intrinsic complexity to these to this kind of language, to the vernacular, that there should be a wider appreciation uh, of that. And even Toni Morrison herself in her writing, there's a way in which she has even said she tried to approximate uh, the speech of African Americans. And she didn't go as far as uh, kind of clipping words in an orthographic way to represent dialect, but nonetheless, she was sensitive to uh, the kinds of speech that, on the one hand, could be formal, but also could be uh, informal. This kind of wide array of language that we all uh, gravitate within and around as human beings, depending on our social context. Je that very human experience of expression is something that we can appreciate more today, I hope. How difficult was it for you to get at the research to deal with Putting up, bringing all this stuff forward, it, it, that, that's a, one of the real difficulties about writing is to find the sources that will allow us to make those kind of distinctions that you did. And I'm really happy, I really want to read the book because I, that kind of work I think is, is re really remarkable for us struggling amateurs. Oh, no. Thank you very much, and uh, I, I appreciate that. I, you know, I did spend 12 years working on this book, and 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 I and I began. You know, you know uh, Professor Beavers talked about uh, Dean's Truants. That's where it began, where you kind of do a close reading of his writing. Uh, you try to understand what other scholars have been saying about his work, and that just gave me a very wide perspective on of my own impressions of his work, but also how other people were appreciating him. As time went on, and I was working on this uh, biography, there are various streams of research that I conducted. First of all, there were some previous biographies done 
right? And those previous biographies, there was a kind of a, a vacillation between fact and fiction. Some things, uh, there's great myth in his, in his works, rather sensationalist myth, that you have to uh, discern what, what's true and, and what's false. And so you had that to work with. There was also the stream of his letters of correspondence, you know, all the letters to family, friends, acquaintances, his literary agent, all of those different people, and to um, read them all closely and map out the kind of information that's in there. Uh, there's also the Paul Lawrence Dunbar papers that's held at the Ohio Historical Society, where you can see not only the original versions of these letters in, in, in handwriting, but you could see the various artifacts that were retained over time, such as his utilities bills, or um, you, know, you can see various contracts for leases of property in there, or you can see old photos of, of him um, as a young man. You, you know, I recreate some of this, or, or I reprint this in the book. You can see the program for his high school graduation. And, and you see in there the other classmates uh, who graduated with him, but also he delivered uh, the graduation poem uh, during that ceremony. And so when you compile all of that information and you map it out, then you have, in my view, as complete an image as possible. And then you just take your time in telling that story. You know, I will say that one of the challenges of writing this book is that you can talk about so many things, it could really be a thousand pages, and I, and I assure you that it's not a thousand pages, that book. You know, in fact, it, you know, but it was, but this book was, uh, the manuscript was much longer than it was um, uh, as you encounter it, and you had to scale it back, because the thing about biography as well is that you have to identify the right storylines to uh, lay out for readers so that Dunbar's life is accessible and so that you can retain key uh, information. And so there's the element, if, if I may, of gathering the evidence, there's the actual laying out of the information so that you can do the writing, and then there's the writing itself and the editing, all of those different things combined in order to complete the work. Uh, my question is, um, being so transparent with the vernacular, I see that there can be a manifestation of mimicry and it can interfere with that fine line of flattery and mimicry. So how do you compensate for a book being so transparent about quote unquote Ebonics? Um, I see it all over social media, um, people emulating, I don't know if they are aware of it or not, um, African Americans attempting to sound African American, and I don't know if it's because it's popular on TikTok, Instagram, how do you compensate for that and how do you educate uh, people about that fine line? Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question. I think it's important to understand, at least in the case of Dunbar, that he was not writing his poems in a vacuum, right? He was well aware of the kinds of work that would sell. I mean, if, if you're a writer and you, if you're a professional writer in the sense of, you know, earning a living based on your writing, right? And, and that is how you, um, you know, build your resources and that's how you um, support your lifestyle. You have to understand what your readers want. And so, on the one hand, he knew very much that there were certain kinds of literature that would sell. And dialect, as we discussed, uh, was one of those things. It was remarkably popular in the uh, second half of the 19th century. And in that context of writing, let's say, a dialect poetry or dialect uh, fiction, he was able to imbue African American experiences with a certain kind of humanity, a certain kind of complexity that he felt would be important for the annals of literary history, and that's turned out to, to, to be the case. Uh, but both things can be true. It, on the one hand, it can be true that he is appealing to a marketplace that has particular preconceptions about African Americans. Again, you know, when you look at uh, 1890, in the mid-1890, that's only three decades away from uh, emancipation. 
three decades in the past from, from today is 1990s. And I'm sure some of you would think that wasn't so long ago, right? And so if you were uh, looking at a world in Dunbar where you have some people who actually lived through slavery and were still alive, or saw firsthand the trauma of slavery, or you were interacting with people who previously might have owned slaves, right, and they're in a world where they do not anymore, that was the ideological context in which he was conceiving of a literary marketplace, and it was through that particular medium he was trying to develop a poetic craft that on the one hand would appeal to that audience, but on the other, to what extent could he um, deliver a certain kind of message? If you use that as an example, uh, then today, uh, I guess in the more contemporary uh, sphere of uh, ex vernacular expression, uh, understanding what is the audience by, you know, against which vernacular constructions are actually appealing or not. I think all the kinds of vernaculars that you may come across today are in concert with the ways in which those speakers are actually understanding the world in which they live. Okay, um, hi, I want to thank you for, for the book. Okay, and what I'd like to say is uh, when I read his poem, When Melindy Sings, mm -hmm. I think to me that was, what he, that was him expressing how he felt about dialect. And almost, almost it's, it's almost the same as when the, um, that, uh, if, it don't got, if it don't have that squint, you know, uh, I'm getting nervous because I'm on a microphone. But oh, no, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like when he, when he talks about that, how when Melindy sings, how when you try to imitate it and you just can't, you just can't get anything cl close to that, I, don't, I think he not only was he talking about Melindy, he was talking about himself and the people who imitate him. Yeah, you know, I think, and when Melindy sings, that was one of his more famous uh, poems in the biography. I talk about there was a there was sort of a, a canon of poems that he recited um, uh, to audiences. When Melindy sings was 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 one of them, and uh, you know, and I will say, uh, Melindy in particular, uh, you know, th there have been some debates about that poem. Uh, to what extent is it explicitly a reference to African American experience or not? Right? Is it just entirely in the purchase of the dialect, or are there other kinds of illusions? And so uh, I, I think now we're reaching a time where with this information of the biography, I believe you can do fantastic readings of that kind of work. What made his uh, struggle and awareness with the use of the vernacular different or unique than other black performer or, or um, who performed for white audiences and had a revenue stream, whether it was in blackface or there was, a, or even Robeson, who made a lot of films and then Robeson. kind of realized these weren't the kind of films he should have been making. So I guess what made his struggle with being black and having to oftentimes get money from white audiences, which meant you're in the stereotypical, you know, realm, what made it unique or different than what yeah. other black people were experiences that had to garner revenue yeah. that way? I think, you know, that's a great question. I, I think if you look at the particular uh, historical moment in which he was writing, he was in great proximity to minstrelsy, where you actually had whites in blackface performing dialect, right? And that was appreciated by audiences. And also on the tail end, on the back end of minstrelsy, you have vaudeville, too, right? And so as opposed to some of the later writers, let's say, of the new Negro Renaissance in Harlem, the Harlem Renaissance and towards the, the mid 20th century, you do have uh, Dunbar who, the milieu in which he was performing was also interlaced with this kind of culture of minstrelsy. And the thing that distinguished Dunbar from uh, whites and blackface is that he was the, quote unquote, the uh, authentic article Right, that he was uh, an actual person of, of, of African descent who was able to convey this speech in ways that were not so uh, dissimilar from what whites had encountered in these uh, minstrel settings. And so when you go to the review by Howells of Dunbar's poem, you can see in there the applause from Howells because Dunbar himself is that 
truly, the, in his view, the authentic black poet, right, in a way that unlike we, we've seen before. And I actually, you know, address that because uh, there were other black poets prior to him, you know, from Phyllis Wheatley, you know, uh, all the way uh, up. But there's a way that as Dunbar was emerging towards the latter part of the 19th century, on the heels of the vogue for dialect, as we talked about, and minstrelsy, there's a way that the commercial appreciation for minstrelsy kind of congealed around Dunbar, particularly. Uh, and uh, that distinguished the way in which he had to deal with it as opposed to uh, those later. People later saw what Dunbar was going through and saying, hey, wait a second, what's he doing? So we want to thank you all for coming out and for these great questions. Um, I think we are going to repair upstairs where you're going to sign some books. Um, so please stay with us for that. But in the meantime, thank you so much for coming out. You have proven with this book that you are um, one of the great um, archival detectives of your generation. And I'm appreciate deeply that. appreciative of what you've done here. Thank you so much, Amy. Thanks for having me. Thank you.